So, what I want to do today is sort of give you a, give you an overview over what I think is the right way of thinking about models and representation. So, hence this uh, um, slightly cheeky title. So, I just want to talk about um, the inner life of a model. So. Uh, the starting point is sort of commonsensical, so models are ubiquitous in science and in engineering. Uh, hardly a scientific achievement that is not in one way or another based on a model to think of planetary motion, the theory of heat, nuclear and atomic structure, etc., etc., all these things are heavily reliant on models, and if you study these things, you rely on models. Um, well, I forgot to say, if you have clarificatory questions, please raise your hand immediately. So, if you totally disagree with me and want to refute everything I've said, please wait until the end, because otherwise I never get through. But if just something's not clear, just raise your hand and let me know. So, why is this? I mean, why are models important in this way? Uh, the point is that investigations are often carried out on models rather than on reality itself. So you study a model, you discover features of the model, and through that you discover uh, features of the target system that the model is supposed to be a model of. Why can we do that? So what happens here? And the, the key here is to realize that models are representations. So, so models can perform these investigative functions because they are representations of their respective target systems. And so when I prepared this talk, I took to this place where knowledge resides these days, known as the Internet. So I Googled what is a model, and the first sort of eight out of the ten pages said, well, a model is a representation of something else. That's quite right, and I found this nice graph here. So so a model is a representation of a particular phenomenon in the world. I mean, that seems modulo some qualifications they come to later seems to be sort of at least in a first order approximation the right thing to say. Now, obviously, leaving at that doesn't really say much because you will immediately ask, well, what does that mean? A, a, what is representation? And B, not every kind of representation is sufficient for what we want to do. So what kind of representation do we need? We need one, surely, that explains how knowledge transfer is possible. That's the point I just mentioned. And at this point, people sometimes turn around and say, well, representation is really just another word for producing a mirror image. Now, I don't want to discuss that in detail here, but just want to say that this is wrong. And Virginia Woolf hit the nail on the head when she said, well, art is not a copy of the real world. One of the damn things is enough. And we add here that neither science is a copy of the real world. And sort of the mirroring idea typically comes sort of in the guise of similarity and isomorphism views of representations. So I think these are a bad idea. They are either wrong, if you take the idea very strict, or, or, or they become empty if you're sufficiently liberal. So I'm not going to argue for this here today. I, I want to give you what I think is the right way of thinking about representation, but I'm not just dodging the bullet. If you want to know what my reasons are for dismissing these other accounts, they, they're written up here. So this is a, a piece I wrote jointly with James Nguyen. Uh, it came out in this massive book. I think it's thicker than the Bible. So uh, several kilos, you break your back when you have to carry it. So part is responsible for that. So about 50 pages are our own. So if you, if you want to know what my quibbles are with these other accounts of representation, I refer you here. You can also download it from my, my website. So our chapter is there. Okay, so what is the question then that we have to answer? The question really is what turns an object into a representation? And 
if you want to make this a bit more formal, we can ask, well, what fills the blank in this biconditional? So M, a model, is a scientific representation of T if and only if blank. What are we supposed to put there? Now, to warm you up to that problem a little bit, I want to tell you sort of what um, the cousin problem in the visual arts is. If you see this here, so that's a Monet painting of the Houses of Parliament in London. You recognize that immediately. But why is this? A per se, this is a flat surface, it's a canvas that's covered with certain chemicals. How is it that a flat surface covered with certain pigments uh, comes to represent the House of Parliament? Or if that's sort of too far out in the arts for the more sciencey types among you. So here's a scientific example. Does anybody recognize that? It's the Philips Newlin machine. This is a physical machine. It's about two and a half meters high, a meter and a half wide. It has a water tank and a pump here. And these are pipes. So water is pumped through here. And then it goes through various valves and reservoirs and tanks and on. So per se, this is just a piece of elaborate plumbing. But this is a representation of an economy. It's been built at the London School of Economics by Phillips and Newlin, and it basically represents a Keynesian uh, economy. And so the question is, of course, how comes that this piece of plumbing is a representation of an economy? How does it happen? And I will say more about this. Same question. Well, this here, so it looks a bit like sort of a tried to make props for horror movies here. So, but I promise you, so I didn't have any cineastic <laughs> intentions here. And it's not even me. So this has been done by, by Kendrew. And even though it looks a bit like something for a movie, it's actually the stuff of a Nobel Prize. So that's a model of myoglobin. And so um, Kendrew and his team used models like these. They are plasticine sausages on sticks to study the structure of myoglobin and that won them the Nobel Prize in, in chemistry, I think, in the early 60s, 62, I think. So how is it that this plasticine sausage represents myoglobin? So now you see where the thing goes. You can multiply examples now. So, so metal cans are used as models of ships. Electrical circuits are, models as you, uh, are used as models of brain function. Robots are used to model insects, etc., etc., etc. So in each of these cases, you can ask, well, how does it happen that these objects are representations of something else? Now, some of you may have noticed that what I've given you so far are all material objects, the physical things you can put on your laboratory table. Now, not all models are of this kind. So some models are what one can call in the most neutral way possible non-concrete models. And Ian Hacking has this beautiful phrase. He says well, that some models are things that you hold in your head rather than in your hands. But there is a big question about what these things, if they're things at all, are that you hold in your head rather than in your hands. And many models are of this kind. So here's a, try to symbolize a planetary model here. So um, two perfect spheres with a homogeneous mass distribution that, that attract each other gravitationally. That's effectively Newton's model of the solar system. So you can't put that on a laboratory table. You hold it in your hand. But still, we can ask, what makes two homogeneous perfect spheres uh, a model of the sun and the earth? What's happening here? Or similar, if you take the uh, drop of granular liquid, so you, I can think about such a drop, but don't have to consider a real drop. And that, those of you who have done some nuclear physics will know, that has been used as a model of the nucleus. So a Weizsäcker did 
quite some calculation on such an object as a model of the nucleus. How does it happen that the new, an imagined drop becomes a model of the nucleus? And if that's not enough, here are a few other models that are of the same kind. There's the MIT bag model of quark confinement or the Bohr model of the atom. Shelling model of social segregation, they're all of this kind, the sort of objects you hold in your head. <clears throat> Good. So that sets, in a sense, the plan for the talk. So I want to dedicate part one to representing with materials models. So I want to talk about how things like the Phillips Newland machine work, and then say a bit something about representing with non material model. The main action is here. So if I'm still talking about material stuff th three quarters through the talk, don't get nervous yet. So I, uh, the, the first part is much shorter. Uh, sorry, it's much longer than the second part. And the reason for this is that I think the semantic concepts that we use are actually the same in both cases. So what we just have to do is understand how we use non-material things in the representational scheme that I will outline, but the, the representational machinery, or that's my claim at any rate, is the same for material and non-material models. But a lot of things I want to say are more intuitive when said about a material object than about a non-material object. That's why I think I introduced the account of representation with material objects, and then say how it carries over to non-material objects. Okay. So, representing with material models. Recall, we have agreed, or at least I have agreed with myself, that we should not uh, get into similarity and mirroring, so I'm not talking about that. So the heuristic that we're going to use is the notion of a representation as. So, um, a number of authors have noted that representation as is sort of a concept that seemed to be useful for scientific representation. You find it in Rick Hughes or Van Frosten or also Catherine Elgin, who we will talk about more later. So what is that? Well, if it's a mode of representation you often find in, in, in caricature. This is just sort of to warm you up to the idea. Oops, where do I have my jacket? Sorry. Um, so here is Thatcher represented as a boxer. Um, oh, it's a bit more contemporary. Here is Theresa May represented as a ghost. She's a lot of, yeah, there's unionists waiting here, and she says, "Do come on in and just ignore the smells." And it's a very fitting comment on current politics. So you have seen that one already, that's the Philip Newlin machine, so that's the Guatemalan economy represented as a pipe system, and I'll say a bit more about why I picked Guatemala here, this is n not just because I'd like to go there at some point, but this has some systematic reason I come back to. But that's Maya Globin represented as a plasticine sausage. So that's the heuristic motivation for getting into representation as. Now to discuss what representation as means, let's introduce a little bit of notation. So we call X the object that does the representing, so the Phillips Newlin machine, plasticine sausage. Y is the real world target of the representation, namely the Guatemalan economy or myoglobin. And Z, that's a bit less clear for now, just try to to get the intuitive idea, um, it's the kind of representation that it is. Uh, so in the caricature with Thatcher, this was a boxer, because it's a boxer representation. Or in the case of May, it was a ghost, because it was a ghost representation. And, and I'll say more about this later, but sort of that's the intuition. So then here is a definition from a Catherine Elgin. So she gives this account of representation as, she says, when X represents Y as Z, it is because X is a Z representation that denotes 
y as it does. So x does not merely denote y and happen to be a z representation. Rather, in being a z representation, x exemplifies certain properties and imputes those properties or related ones to y. Now, that is quite a mouthful, so I don't expect that you digested all that. So, so I like visual representation, so I tried to morph this into a graph. So the account that we get here is really that you have x, that's the representational vehicle, that is a z representation, and we still have to explain what exactly that means, that denotes the target system y. This exemplifies certain properties that are associated with z and imputes these to y. And imputation is basically the, cell, the same as a property ascription. So I just keep using the word because that's how Goodman and Elgin speak, and they use a lot of Goodman and Elgin. But if sort of imputation is not a concept that comes sort of naturally, then just think as a property ascription. So the, these properties are ascribed to the target. So here is how this is supposed to work in the case of the caricature. So that's the boxer representation. It denotes Margaret Thatcher. It exemplifies certain boxer properties like being brutal or being ruthless or something, something along those lines at any rate. And it imputes these to Thatcher. So, I mean, that's how the caricature works. This? Yeah, I will. I will come to that. So, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good, good question. So, I mean, part of why I find this appealing is that you exactly can make that distinction. Oh, come, thanks, thanks. Yeah. So, other clarificatory issues, or should I? Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, well, look. So far, I'm setting up the framework, but the claim would be that thinking about it in these terms lends itself to an answer that is more sub substantive. I mean, that would be the claim. I. Oh yeah, that's the. That's the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> Good. So what we have to do is. We have to come to terms with okay, the notion of a Z representation. I guess that's Jan's question. So what is this here? So we need to say something about denotation. We need to say something about exemplification. These are just words so far. So I have to say what we mean by these. And so sort of that's really set the agenda now. So I want to spend sort of 10 minutes on exp explaining what Goodman and Elgin mean by that. And then... I want to remold these concepts so that they fit scientific representation because they introduced that in a different context. I mean, recently Catherine Elkin said, well, no, no, we can use that also for scientific representation, and I agree with that. But the concepts need to be shaped in a slightly different way. So I want to now say what, what Goodman and Elgin have in mind originally and then re rework it. So denotation. Now, I don't have to tell you that. Yeah philosophers of language here, so about just to re re refresh memory. So denotation is a two-place relation that holds between the symbol and the object to which it, it applies. So the paradigmatic examples, of course, are proper names. So the name Roman denotes me. Or, so that's the sort of things we have in mind. And Goodman and Elgin say that denotation really is the core of representation. And we can say X is a representation of, and the of is really important here, Y, if X denotes Y. So this, the string of letters Roman is a representation of me because it denotes me. A consequence of this is immediately that uh, pictures of unicorns, say, don't 
represent, or they're not representations of anything, because you can only denote things that exist, and unicorns don't exist. So that's something you have to buy into if you believe in that account. And then you may sort of get nervous and say, well, look, this can't really be. I mean, this is from, from the London Underground. So um, this is an energy company trying to sell you an energy account, the first utility, with a wonderful flock of unicorns. I mean, if this is not a representation of anything, I mean, why would they pay so much money to put it on the wall in the London Underground? So there must be something going on. And, of course, um, Goodman and Elgin would, would agree with that. They just think it's not representation of. So Goodman's diagnosis here is that we misled into believing that something is a representation only if there is something in the world that it represents. And he then distinguishes between a picture of a unicorn and a unicorn picture. And that's often the hyphen is the important bit here. So that's an, an unbreakable a predicate here. It's just a unicorn representation. Or more generally, a representation of a Z and a Z representation have to be distinguished. So these are two different concepts. And the important thing is that one does not imply the other. Some Z representations denote the set and others don't. And some representations are or some representations of a Z are Z representations and others aren't. And if you think that this is just a bit too much philosophical hair splitting, I want to convince you now that this is actually quite natural to make this distinction when you try to understand how certain representations work. Now, this is a representation of Europe. And here, this is then a territory representation. And it is also a, it's a representation of a territory. So in, this is a case where the two come together, as one would intuitively expect. But now look at this here. I hope you would agree that this is a territory representation. Yeah? Mm -hmm. does, does anybody recognize that? I mean, TV? Sorry? Uh, yeah, in the right direction. It's the, it's the world according to Game of Thrones. <laughs> ah. so, uh, I picked that because the fan community, to which I don't belong, I just find the map interesting, has now reached such, such levels of elaboration that you can buy an entire atlas full of maps of the world according to Game of Thrones. So you can buy... Um, the Atlas of England and the Atlas of Game of Thrones. It's a nicely printed, thick book. So this is a territory representation, but it's not a, a representation of a territory because the world of Game of Thrones doesn't exist. So this is Esteros and Westeros. I mean, they don't exist. So this is a case where you have a Z representation that is not a representation of a Z. Or look at this here. I think this is late 19th century, but certain things never change. So, um, uh, so this is a territory representation. It's the British Isles here, and here is France. And something so, so, sort of unspeakable happens here. Uh, so this is a territory representation, but it's not a representation of a territory. It's a representation of a national attitude. It seems to be surprisingly stable across time. Uh, so here you also see how the Z and the what it represents come apart. Or well, finally look at this string of letters. So, well, that's not a territory representation, but it's a representation of a territory, namely Europe. So summing up what we have seen here, we can do this matrix here. So we have representation of sets and Z representations. If it's yes, yes, you get Europe. If it's no and yes, you get the Game of Thrones and the British attitude towards the French. Um, here is the word Europe. And if something is neither a representation of a set nor a Z representation, then it's just a mere object. It's not a representation at all. So I hope I have motivated now that it makes sense to separate these two concepts.
this of course immediately raises the question what makes something a Z representation? That's Jan's question. <laughs> and here views diverge. As far as I can see, the two schools of thought, sort of the orthodox account, as it were, is the perceptual account that goes back to uh, Gombrich, Wolheim, and others. Most recently, Lopez has defended that. And it, sort of the core idea here is that X is a Z representation if under normal conditions observer would see a Z in X. So you see the House of Parliament in the canvas. That's what makes it the House of Parliament representation. Um, Goodman and Elgin want to go a different way. They have this genre account. They say, well, we sort pictures naturally into genres. So we see them as Napoleon pictures or house pictures. And it's the genre that, or the belonging to a class of genres that does the work. Now, I don't want to get into that because I think whatever the, the relative merits of these accounts in the case of visual representation, they don't work for scientific modeling. So you have to do something else. So just bear these in mind sort of to boost your intuition. But so we want to take this, we mean, um, um, James and I have been working on this, and to take this in a different direction later. So let's take stock. This is the diagram again. I hope we understand set representation and denotation a bit better. So I have to say something about exemplification. Now, what do we mean by exemplification? And before I say what it is, let me say what the motivation behind is. What we want to explain in, when we think about models is what is the kind of representation that objects have that have a certain internal structure sort of unlike lexicographical symbols, which in a sense just bear reference to their reference. So in the case of models, you're really interested in what the model itself does. I mean, that's why Phillips and Newland went away and built this elaborate machine. I mean, they had no intrinsic interest in plumbing. So they were economists, and they wanted to understand how an economy works. So we need an account of representation that at some point pays attention to the internal structure, the properties that the model itself has. And that motivates getting into exemplification because exemplification gives us this. So what then is exemplification? The simplest example of exemplification is when you see something like this. You go to a paint shop, you want to paint your living room, you say, hey, I, I, want, I want a painted red. Then they show you this and say, you want this red or that red or that red. So these color patches, they um, exemplify certain shades of red. And now we see what exemplification is. So an item exemplifies a property if it represents by instantiating that property. The color swatch here has that property, a particular shade of red. And it also functions symbolically by representing that shade of red. And if the representation is done by having the property, then it's exemplification. So in a nice formula that Goodman coined, one could say exemplification is possession plus reference. If you only have reference, it's not exemplification. You can have a very long word to describe this shade of red. You can say it's light crimson or something like that. Uh, that represents that shade of color because it refers to it. But the word doesn't exemplify that color because it doesn't have the color. If you need other examples, samples generally are of that kind, you go to the market and you try a bit of the cheese before you buy it. So that little bit of cheese that the vendor gives you is a sample and it re presents a cheese property by exemplification. That's the idea. Now, what's important here is that exemplification is selective. So it's a necessary condition for a property to, represent, to be represented by exemplification that the property is instantiated. But vice versa, an object doesn't exemplify all the properties that it instantiates. So 
you look at this again, when, when these color charts are used in the context of a paint job, they don't um, exemplify rectangularity. Because it just doesn't matter whether the thing is rectangular, or round, or sort of egg-shaped, or what have you. So it's the context that selects the properties that are exemplified. If I steal that from the shop and bring it to geometry class and hold it up and say rectangular, then obviously that can become an exemplification of rectangularity. But in the paint shop, it doesn't. So that's very important. The context selects a few of the properties, usually, um, to be exemplified. So an important aspect, and again, that I've already said that, we're interested in internal behavior. So we're looking at properties that are instantiated in the model here. Another important aspect of this is that you have epistemic access to properties that are exemplified. So if you look at the color chart, you see what the color is, and that's important. If the vendor asks you whether you want light crimson, then that may not be meaningful to you at all, because you may not be familiar with the word, or you have never seen light crimson. So the word light crimson doesn't really tell you anything much, because it doesn't by itself give you epistemic access to the color, but the color swatch does that. It gives you epistemic access to, to the color. So we understand now exemplification, and we can go over this again to see how it works. So this is the boxer representation. It denotes stature. It exemplifies certain property. It imputes these on the target. And but there's a lot to be said about this bit in particular, so if you think about it carefully. But I don't want to get into this because I want to do this differently in the case of science anyway. So, yeah. So maybe you said that very well. Is this something like predicating? Yes, it's it's a it's it's a property ascription, effectively. So you just yeah, yeah. So this is the caricature is is understood as making the claim that Thatcher is brutal. So he describes brutality to her, or he claims that Thatcher instantiates brutality. So that's what the imputation is supposed to capture. Um, does that make sense? Is that yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, it's good. So, so now let's get into science from here. The idea is, of course, that you just take the caricature out and you put the scientific model into the account. So then you would get something like this. Uh, so this is an economy representation. It denotes the Guatemalan economy. And we pick Guatemala because we went over records of central banks. And while th this thing was really quite fashionable at the, for, for a while, so many central banks had one of those machines, but Guatemala is the only case that we could trace where the machine was actually used for policy making. So they really, they took the thing, set the parameters as they thought they should be set for the Guatemalan economy and checked what the machine was doing. And this had a concrete background. So Guatemala, this in the 1950, was heavily dependent on exporting rubber to the United States. And they had a land reform in Guatemala that the Americans didn't like. And they threatened to put an embargo on Guatemalan rubber. And so the Guatemalans were very concerned about what this would do to, to their economy. And so they used this machine to figure out what would happen if you basically switch off the foreign sector. And so this is a clear case then, therefore, where the Guatemalans really took this to be a representation of the Guatemalan economy. But it's also an economy representation, the machine that they had in the Bank of England. They actually had one. So it was never really used for what we can tell from publicly available records. Uh, it has never been used as a representation of the British economy. So they used it for training, maybe they used it for other things, but they never said, this represents the British economy. Still, the thing that the Bank of England had was an economy representation. It wasn't just a piece of plumbing. I mean, they wouldn't have bought that just to have water pipes. So 
the one of the advantages of that scheme is that it, it allows you nicely to make that distinction between how the Brits use the machine and how the Guatemalans used it. We have to say then that this exemplifies certain economy properties and it imputes these to the economy if it's used like this. Now we want to have a few problems at our hands here. So we have to say, and that's where the talk started, I mean, what's an economy representation in this context? I mean, how does this become an economy representation? How does it exemplify property? And what do we mean by imputation in this case? It turns out that in the case of science, this is actually a bit more complicated than in the case of a caricature. So let's start with Z representations. Oh, we have a new version. That's good news. Oh, remind me tomorrow. Yeah. <laughs> So, our claim is, and you, you remember in the case of the visual representations, people said, well, we see something in the representation, or it belongs to a genre. Now, neither of this works. You don't just see an economy in this, and neither does the thing belong to a genre of some sort. In fact, in, in, I mean, part, this got so famous, because no one has ever done anything like it before. <laughs> it, it, it was really quite unusual to do it in this way. And the idea is now that this becomes an economy representation if we put an interpretation on it. And to show you what an interpretation is, I want to show you a video which really brings the point home. So, calculations. so you, you, you see the real machine here. So. Good, I think you get, you get the gist of this. So uh, let me bring my slides back. Uh, so here's this guy standing in front of this water tank and say, well, here is the bank, and here's the foreign sector, here are the taxes, etc., etc." So what happens here really is that one has this object, which is O, and this has certain properties here, namely water properties in this case, flows, valves, etc. And then you pick a domain of interest, which is the domain of an economy here. And the interpretation really maps concepts onto each other. Now, a lot can be said about how exactly that works, but sort of the first step is that sortal properties are just paired up. So like having a large reservoir in the middle is paired up with um, having a central bank. Uh, and if properties are, ma are mass terms, they also receive a mass correlation function. So the amount of water corresponds to the amount of money in the, in the machine. So you get functions like a liter of water corresponds to a million 
in the water, in the model currency, something like that. And if you impose such an interpretation on the machine, that is what really turns it into a Z representation. It's important to note that nothing forces you to adopt a particular interpretation. You could take the same machine and say, well, this can be used as an education system representation, for instance. And you could interpret the various tanks as universities and the, the, the water as flow of students. You're completely free to do so. So you really enjoy great freedom in A, how you describe the machine, which properties you identify as relevant, and what you, you pair them up with. So and that's really up to the practitioners to figure that out. And, and there are the, the funny episodes about how they try to find out which to look at. So at the, at the beginning, the machine tended to leak, sort of the water was, was running out of the machine. And they tried to fix that, because they thought that the, the quantity of money has to be preserved. But they couldn't fix the machine. <laughs> Somehow they were stuck. And someone came with the idea and said, hang on, we can interpret that. The, the water that's leaking is from the black mark. So, so suddenly you had an interpretation for the leaking money. Namely, that was the money that would flow from the legitimate economy into the black economy. Okay. Um, so you, you can play around with this. And this is really sort of very, very interesting to see how this works. So with this, we can give a set representation definition. So a set representation then is just an ordered pair of the object X and the interpretation I that is imposed on the object. And now here is my minimal definition of what a model is. A model is simply a Z representation where X has been chosen by a scientist or a scientific community, if you like, to be a model. And that's really what a model is. Yeah. Well, I don't care so much how it's formulated. It's typically given as a set of propositions. I mean, you describe it linguistically. You say the big water tank is the central bank, a million of uh, the model currency corresponds to a liter of water. What the ontology of this is, I mean, do we say we only describe it in this way, but the interpretation is the actual pairing I am, um, I'm happy with that, if you like. So if you have more nominalist leanings, you can say the interpretation just is a description. Um, I don't really mind that. I don't think it matters for this. I mean, it's really it's important that you have this pairing of properties, however you then decide to analyze what a pairing is. Yeah, you, you can put it in this way. It's a bit, yeah. It, yeah. It's a bit harder because of the mass terms. If you want to go sort of purely set theoretically, just map these things. That that works well for sorted properties, but it doesn't work well for. Yeah. Yes, I mean, you can cash this out in, in different ways if you think we need a more precise definition. Yeah, exactly. I but I mean, that's. Yeah, good. Yeah. I'd, thanks. I'd, I'd be happy with that. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, that is just what I told you already. Not, not at this point. I mean, it. it I would. Yeah. 
I would just remain neutral about this. I wouldn't say they're not instantiated. At the moment, whether they are instantiated or not is just not a question. So um, we, we simply say we have concepts from a certain field of interest. Here, Z is an economy. We pick properties from that, we're, and we're just not commenting on whether the real economy does instantiate these properties or not. Yeah. Uh, but I, I come to your question in a, in a minute. You, you've, you've gotten ahead already. So, so let's build up a general account. So I'll sort of build up a whole graph here. So we have the first bit in place. We know what the model is. It's an object with an OZ interpretation that turns this object into a Z representation. And it denotes the target T. Just a side remark. I just talk about denotation to keep things simple. That can involve part-part denotation, just like the family photograph has sort of, okay, that the photograph as a whole denotes the family as a whole, the part of the photograph denotes the mother and the part denotes the father. So that's um, just understood that when I speak of denotation, it can also involve part-part denotation. So what about instantiation? Maybe you've noticed that we're sort of speaking a bit loosely when we say that, well, the object instantiates Z properties. I mean, Z properties are properties of an economy, but the, um, the X is a water pipe system, so that doesn't literally instantiate economy properties. Uh, it's not a deep problem here, but I think if you want to give a more or less careful formulation of the count, we have to say how we do it. And that's why it helps to introduce the notion of of instantiation under an interpretation. So the machine literally instantiates the property of having one liter of water in the particular tank. Under the interpretation, it then also instantiates the property of having a million of the model currency in a particular bank. Um, I mean, th that is really little more than um, terminology. But I think it's important to formulate it properly. And then also we can say I exemplification is I instantiation plus reference. That, that. So with that, we have this in place. And you now will know what the I stands for. Now let's turn to imputation of, or property ascription. Several questions referred to already. In the case of the caricature, we wanted to be fairly direct here and say, okay, this instantiates certain properties like being brutal, and it claims that they're just also in, instantiated here in the target. I think in the case of scientific models, that, that, that can't be handled as simply as that. So scientific models don't usually portray their targets as having exactly the same features as the model itself. Um, and hence, properties exemplified by the models are typically not ones that are imputed to the target. So we have to introduce sort of an extra filter, as it were, at this point. And so I call that filter the translation key. Now, what is that? Just again to um, boost your, your intuitions on this, it's basically something that you have experience with in the case of maps. Here's a map of Switzerland. So you I thought that is something nice and neutral. What are the properties exemplified by the map? The map I have looked at here exemplifies the, the property of having a distance between top and bottom of 22 centimeters. I mean, you don't want to impute that to Switzerland. I mean, the place is small, but it's not that small. So you want to impute the property that the north-south extension is 220 kilometers. So you, of course, use the scale of the map to convert that property into that property. Or look at the dot that has core written on it. Uh, here. Sorry, that's a bit small. But if you could see it properly, you would find out that it lies in a yellow area. I assure you, the city of Coor is not yellow. So um, this is not the way you should read this. So of course, you look at the legend of the map, and you find out that being in a yellow area means that the city is 600 meters above sea level. So that's the property you're supposed to 
impute to the target. And similar things happen in scientific models. So when using litmus or, or generally scientific representation, another simple example is litmus paper. You stick litmus paper into a solution, then the litmus paper turns either blue or red or something in between. Now, you're not supposed to infer that the solution is blue or red. You're supposed to infer something about its pH value. If it turns red, it has a low pH value. So you basically turn red into being acidic. Or in models, you can have a tolerance threshold. You, see, you don't want to impute the exact value, but say it's plus minus 5%. Or you, have, or you impute only a tendency, say, well, it's either positive or negative. Or it gets you in the whole discussion of different idealizations or kinds of analogies. All that goes into the key here. So what you have to introduce in the scheme for it to be general is that you have the exemplified properties. They keyed up with a different set of properties. And now these set of properties are imputed onto the target. Good, and just to wrap this up, this is what you have just seen, just a bit smaller, and that speaks to your question, I think. I just want to make explicit that this is all given to you by descriptions. So this is the model itself, and this, this, these boxes are basically for description. So DM is the model description. And this, and this is important for later, can be broken up in two parts. There is the object description. So there's part of the model description that describes the object. You just say, this is a water pipe system with so and so many pipes and valves and so on. And here you specify the interpretation. So you say, water corresponds to money, etc. And you typically also have a target description that helps you identify what the target is. And the Guatemalan economists try to model their economy. They obviously have means to refer to the economy and say, well, that's our target. And I think that is the general account of representation I'd like to, to propose here. So that, these are all the moving parts. I promise I am done with boxes now, so you have them all. Um, and we call this the Decky account just to in, uh, signal the important parts of the account, the so C notation, exemplification, keying up, and imputation. We're still looking for a better name. If you have one, let me know. Although this might disappoint people, so a friend of mine sent me that photograph here. You look at the, the number plate. <laughs> so, so we, it's a little fan base building up. So here we go. A few, few corollaries. Um, a representation is faithful if T indeed has the properties that the representation ascribes to it. But that, this is the case, and that's from Alberto's point. It's not built into the notion of representation as. You can represent the, the economy as having huge inflation, and the economy doesn't. So there can be a mismatch. So representation should not be confused with accurate representation. So some uh, representation can be a misrepresentation. And this scheme actually makes room for that. So x can represent y as possessing all these property, these q properties, but y cannot instantiate any of them, and that's fine. Again, think back of the caricature. Obviously, that's taken from a newspaper that I didn't particularly like Thatcher. Uh, but some, someone else may have had a completely different view on that and said, no, no, it's, it's not at all true that Thatcher is, is brutal. Uh, a bit is as it may, the caricature represents her as such, and it, it leaves it open whether she really is or not. Corollary two. So scientific model is not a synonym for scientific representation. And here I want to sort of qualify the bit we had at the beginning where we defined model as a representation uh, a little bit. So it is true that a model is always a something representation with the hyphen. So if you don't have that, then you don't have a model. But that leaves it open whether it is also a representation of 
something. So you can have models that are just something representations. So if the Guatemalans had never used the machine in the way they did, the Philips Newlin machine would have been an economy representation, but it wouldn't have been a representation of an economy. Um, other examples of this are multi-sex populations. So Michael Weisberg discusses these cases of three, four, and five-sex population. That um, a, um, a populations in which you you need not only a male and a female, but a male, a female, and something else, or two something else, to to produce an offspring. There's currently discussion whether there are three sex populations, but I haven't heard news of four sex populations at least. So four sex populations, they are population representation, namely four sex representation, four sex population representation, a mouthful. Um, but they are not representations of four sex population because there are no such population. So if you think of quantum field theory, there are many models of that kind of sort of the phi four model, for instance, that Stefan Hartmann discussed. So, uh, it was clear from the beginning that there were no, no particles corresponding to these kinds of models, but still, there were particle models. So you really do find these things, and I think the account makes room for this quite nicely. It can explain why the entities are models or representations in the hyphenated sense, but not in the off sense. It takes sort of into account how learning from models takes place. So at the beginning, I said representation in science has to be such that it tells us how scientists learn from models. I think this account does that nicely. So you look at what properties are exemplified in the model. You use your keys. You ascribe the key dot property to the target. And then you ask, well, does the target really have these properties? And that's when you're just into the domain of um, hypothesis testing. So Jan knows more about this than I do. But so, so what I'm concerned with here is not to, um, to ask whether the target really has the Q properties. It's, it's a semantic issue, how the Q properties get ascribed to the target. And the account explains that nicely. And finally, obviously, I should uh, say what the scope of the claim here is. The scope here is only that I'm claiming that this is the general form of an account of representation. It has, of course, a lot of moving parts. You have to, in particular, say what the keys are. And this has to be put in from the outside, so there's no um, golden bullet. So scientists just will have to say, look, I take this model to be an idealization of the target of this and this kind, and therefore you connect the model properties to the target properties in a particular way. And what keys there are is actually a good question. So it's sort of a project I'd like to work on. So go through very sort of specific modeling projects and see what keys they use. And in, in physics, it's often limiting keys, so you, you take limits of certain kinds. Okay, so briefly, we've seen at the beginning, not all models are material objects, and Newton's model of the solar system is, to repeat the nice phrase, is something you hold in your head, not in your hands, but many other models are of that kind. So what then do we do with that scheme? when we don't have sort of a nice physical thing here. So the problem really is what goes here. In the Philips Newlin machine, we have this thing rattling. And with the Kendrew model, you have this plasticine sausage, which is roughly this size. You can put it nicely on your desk. So what do we do in the case of Newton? So, on. so what do you put here? I think that's the way to think about the problem. And. Uh, The crucial bit, again, is that you must put something there that meaningfully can be said to have certain features. So model planets must have certain features. So model planets move in certain kinds of orbits, but not in other kinds of orbits. They must be right and wrong in the model. So it must, you must be able to make claims of the sort it is true in the model that such, and it is false in the model that such. And you must have a way to find out. So there must be an epistemology for these objects. Because if you can't find out what properties the model has, the model becomes useless. I think these are the most important constraints. Mm -hmm. There may be others. So, uh, but I think these are the ones that really matter. And here you can go different ways. 
look, I mean, the account of representation I developed doesn't force any particular ontology of models upon you. Some people want to be structuralists at this point and say models are just mathematical structures, and that's fine. You can just put the mathematical structure here and run your machine. I mean, nothing in what I've said so far would preclude that. So, personally, I don't find that to be sufficient. So, I like to think of models as fictional objects or also objects in inverted commas. Um, and so I'm really going to be very, very quick here because this is all a long discussion, as some of people here know better than I do. So in a sense, of Sherlock Holmes is, is an object. He's a detective, etc. There's right and wrong about him. It's true that Sherlock Holmes plays the violin. It's just wrong that he plays the tuba. And so we, we can make this distinction clearly. So he's a detective, he's, he, he's not a ballet dancer, etc., etc. All these things can meaningfully be said about fictional characters like Sherlock Holmes. And it has an epistemology, so we can find out about these things by studying the novel. Now, a lot can be said about how this works. I mean, some people go radically realist, sort of Meinongian, want to say, well, there really is an object of that sort. Anti-realists want to do this in a different way. And I'm just really very quickly hinting at my own preferred solution to this. So I like pretend theory, as it was introduced by Walton. And the idea here is that the text of a novel provides you the primary or directly generated truth. So the, the Conan Doyle novels at some point tell you that Sherlock Holmes is a detective. So that's the primary truth. But then there are also indirectly generated or implied truths. The sub truths that are not explicitly stated, but they follow from the explicitly stated rules plus certain background principles, uh, Walton calls them principles of generation. For instance, we infer that Sherlock Holmes has a liver. As far as I know, that's not stated explicitly, but because we're told that Sherlock Holmes is a human being, we infer that because we have rules about what human beings are in the background. And one can, in this way, explain how we reason about fiction. And that seems to square very naturally how we reason about models, where the most significant difference is that principles of generation in the case of fiction are, are taken to be either common sense or certainly sort of ordinary language, while in, in, in science they are often mathematical. But that seems to be a matter of presentation, not a matter of principal function. So principles of generation in, in mathematical models can, of course, contain mathematical principles. But that's fine. So, so either way, we see how this relates to this schema here. So we have these descriptions here. And rather than just describing a physical object like the Phillips Newlin machine, parts of the model description will now specify what the fictional object is. Um, part of them will specify what the interpretation is. Um, so let's just set that. Um, and you can do that in the Newton case, for instance, just to show you that this is not a com complete Mickey Mouse philosophy of science. So you, if you look at sort of a textbook in, in basic mechanics, the sort of stuff that students read in the first year, you will get a model description of Newton's model. Part of this description will say, well, consider two perfect spheres with a homogeneous mass distribution that are placed in, in absolutely empty space, There's nothing around them, and they attract each other gravitationally. So that specifies the model object, that's the X. And then you will read on a bit and you will hear, well, now you assume that the big sphere is actually fixed in location and that stands for the sun. And the small object moves and that's the planet. So that's effectively giving you the interpretation of the model object. Then you use Newton's equation of motion, that's the principle of generation that 
tells you all kind of properties that the thing has that are not explicitly written into this. You generate these. Some of these you take to be exemplified. For instance, if you find out that the planets exemplify moving in a perfectly elliptical orbit, that's not written into this. You find that out. You key that up through some sort of geometrical approximation. Because you don't want to say that the real planet moves in an exactly elliptical orbit. You can say, well, it's, it's an elliptical orbit plus minus so and so much. That's the key. And that's what you impute to the target system. That's how the representation works. And just as a quick aside, and then I'm, I'm almost done, um, this is not just philosophical rococo. It, it really um, helps you understand how things work. And you see that when you go through the history of science, when you look at how Bohr's model of the atom was constructed, Bohr effectively kept the, the dx and said, well, consider take a big ball and a small ball and all the rest of it. But you interpret it differently. So the 1 over r square force is now not gravity, it's the electrostatic attraction. The big ball is the proton, the small ball is the electron. And there you go, you interpret the same object differently. Well, object if you're anti-realist. Uh, and you get a model of an atom. So, or, or I should say, be precise, you should say it's an atom representation with the hyphen. So that is explained nicely as it goes in the in the schema. And I've mentioned that already. Let's skip that. And so just to wrap up, if one picks up all the pieces, one can come to something like the good modelers checklist. So that this is not only interesting for philosophers but also for practitioners. So first maxim be clear on what your model entity is. So when, what's the object that's doing the modeling for you? Make sure your interpretation is absolutely clear and has no ambiguities. Make sure it's clear what the target is and the notation of the target is actually somehow established. If there is no target, make that clear too. That's still fine. You can have a something representation, but it's not a representation of a something. And sometimes there are confusions on this. I'm happy to talk about this more question time. So never confuse a Z representation with a representation of a set. Be very clear on how they come apart. Be explicit about the properties you take to be exemplified. That's typically done quite well. Spell out the key. That's typically terrible. So um, often you only get vague accounts of how model properties are supposed to relate to other properties. So spelling that out is a real challenge. Say which properties are imputed, and then obviously check the accuracy of the imputation. And on that note, I say thank you very much.